not revelation, it's a revelation. And it's a revelation about Jesus Christ. We talked a little bit about picturing Jesus as a baby, and he was. The mountain we picture Jesus asleep in the boat. He was tired. Uh, many places you go, you can see Jesus hanging on the cross, and that's how people picture Jesus. And he did it. But none of these pictures, is quite the picture that's presented in the book of the Revelation, none of these pictures is quite going to bring us to the place where we can have confidence and where we can face the adversity that's coming and stand firm for God. It's not going to give us the reassurance that we need, the perspective that we'll have to have in order to endure in a world like the world they were in in the first century. We're going to look first of all at John's credibility in verses 9 through 10. Then we're going to look at a picture of Jesus Christ and see who our Lord and Savior presents himself as being. This is a revelation of Jesus Christ. It's not only from Christ, but this portion of it is definitely about him. You look as we read 1 John chapter 1, beginning verse 9. I, John, am your brother and your partner in suffering, and in God's kingdom, and in the patient endurance to which Jesus calls us. I was exiled to the island of Patmos for preaching the word of God and for my testimony about Jesus. It was the Lord's day. And I was worshiping in spirit. Suddenly behind me a loud voice like a trumpet blast said, Write in a book everything you see. And send it to the seven churches in the cities of Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. And when I turned around to see who was speaking to me, I saw seven gold headlamp stands. Sort of a letdown, didn't it? All of a sudden, what does he notice? He notices the golden lampstand. But then, in the light of those lamps, standing in the middle of the lampstand, was someone like the Son of Man. He was wearing a long robe with a gold sash across his chest. His head and his hair were white like wool, as white as snow. And his eyes were like flames of fire. His feet were like polished bronze refined in a furnace. And his voice thundered like mighty ocean waves. He held seven stars in his right hand. And a sharp two-edged sword came from his mouth. And his face was like the sun in all its brilliance. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as if I were dead. But he laid his right hand on me and said, Don't be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I died, but look, I am alive forever and ever. And I hold the key of death and the grave. Write down what you've seen, both the things that are now happening and the things that will happen. This is the meaning of the mystery of the seven stars you saw in my right hand and the seven gold lampstands. The seven stars are angels, are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. Lord, we pray that your Holy Spirit will open our understanding. Lord, show us from your word, from our own consideration today, what it is you want us to know about Jesus Christ. Lord, strengthen and fortify us for what lies ahead. Yes, it's in Christ's name. Amen. We learned about John that John is a servant of Christ in chapter 1, verse 1. He's also a brother to the people in you know, all the seven churches. That's in verse 9. And he said something really great about Jesus loving and freeing us from our sins. And that he included himself in that. All of us who are participants of the gospel of Jesus Christ have that testimony. We are serving Christ because he has freed us from our sins. He's also including them, including himself in the position, in verse 6, of being a kingdom of priests for God. In other words, God has multiplied the priesthood 
put us in the priesthood with the responsibility not only of worshiping God, but of representing God to the world. And you represent God to a significant segment of the world. The people that know you. But John has another characteristic that is true of all believers in the world. He says here in verse 9, I am your brother and your partner in suffering. Now most of them knew at this point that John was exiled on the island of Patmos. He was there because of his testimony and because of his preaching of the word of God. Remember, John was one of those guys who saw Jesus in his glory on the Mount of Transfiguration. He'd already seen this vision in a, in a form. He'd seen Christ face glow. He'd seen his clothes glow. He knew this man was transfigured. He knew this was more than the mere man. He had seen it. He bore testimony to the death of Christ. It's likely that John was the one who took Mary into his home and cared for Jesus' mother as Jesus died there upon the cross. It was John who had seen Jesus on trial in the courtyard. It was John who had laid at Jesus' right side as they ate that last meal. He's intimate with Jesus. He knows Jesus Christ. He's well versed in Jesus Christ. He knows him greatly. And his testimony to the resurrection of Jesus Christ made him a dangerous man in a world where people need to control people by the fear of death. John was the most dangerous man. The government wanted to keep him silent. The only way they could figure out doing that short of killing him, which doesn't accomplish a whole lot, but they put him on the island of Patmos. So now this man can't go from church to 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 church and testify of Jesus Christ and tell of what he's done. He can't do that. He is confined now to this island and he has to witness in a different manner. It calls for, on his part, on the part of his readers and the part of those who are reading today, it requires in us patient endurance. And John is going to recommend that to the churches as he goes through this book. We need patient endurance. We remember the Lord is coming back. Verse 7, he says, look, he comes with the clouds of heaven, and everyone will see him, even those who pierced him. And all the nations of the world will mourn for him. Yes. Amen. Let it be so. Now, from this, we ought to draw these conclusions, I believe. First of all, we're going to suffer in this life. If you're not suffering, hang on. It's coming. If you're going to follow Jesus Christ, you're going to suffer. Now, I'm not talking about when you get old, you're going to suffer. Because you got this ache of pain, and that hurts, and this hurts. And that. No, no. Talk about you're going to suffer for Christ. If you're going to really follow Jesus Christ, there is a, an allotment of suffering that is going to be measured out to you because you follow Jesus Christ. Now, while Jesus Christ is coming soon, he tells them that, it won't happen soon enough to end the suffering of these seven churches. We know that in hindsight. What he's saying to them will help them to endure what they're going through, but they're going to go through it. They're going, in this world, you're going to have, Paul said, tribulation. You're going to have suffering and trouble. Some of these churches have already endured great suffering. In fact, they'd even seen one of their members, a man by the name of Antipas, had already been martyred in one of the cities. He'd been killed for the testimony of Jesus Christ because he was a Christian. And yet they endured. They kept on. It's important for us to keep on preaching and testifying of Christ, of testifying that he has risen from the dead, and that's our hope, and we do not fear what people can do to us. We're going to continue to tell the witness of Jesus Christ. Suffering ought to lead us to witnessing. Because suffering gains the attention of people. When somebody is suffering, people are watching that person and watching how they go through that suffering, how they endure it. 
Second thing we ought to learn from this is we have to keep on worshiping. John is on Patmos. Patmos is not a terrible island uh, if you like a mining town. If you like being out in the middle of the sea, uh, it's not a very big island. But he worships God there. In particular, not only does he worship him every day as a Christian does, but in particular he's on, he says here, the Lord's Day. He said, I was in the, on the Lord's Day, the first day of the week, the day Jesus rose from the dead, the day they discovered the tomb was empty, that first day. That's the day he was worshiping. He said, I was worshiping in remembrance of all of that. And something happened. He said, I was worshiping, and all of a sudden, I was in the Spirit. Now, all Christians have the Spirit of God. They may have not the spirit of Christ, he's none of his, Paul tells us in Romans. Everybody that gets saved gets the Holy Spirit of God to live within you. That's one of the characteristics of this new age of the church. Everybody has the spirit living within them. We are able to walk with God and to enjoy the presence of God because he is living inside of each of us. But I don't think that's what John is referring to here. John is saying, I was in spirit. What I'm about to relate to you happened to me in spirit, not in physical actuality. <coughs> For instance, he's going to talk about in chapter 4, verse 2. In spirit, he was caught up into heaven. What's he saying? My body stayed on Patmos, but in spirit, I was raised up into heaven. He's going to talk about it. In other passages, in verse 17, chapter 17, verse 3, he was taken by spirit out into the wilderness, just like Israel was in the wilderness. He's saying spiritually, in my spirit, in spirit I was taken out to these places. He's going to talk about being taken in spirit to a great high mountain. He's not physically transported there, but he's saying, I had a vision. And in that video, it was so real in spirit, I went and saw these things. I experienced these things. I endured these things. John, if you were watching John in that room, maybe you were one of the worshipers there, you wouldn't know because you couldn't see what John saw. John is experiencing a vision. That's what he's telling us. He said, in this experience, this spiritual experience, I was worshiping, and I heard a voice that said, Right! Wow. Can you imagine that happening behind you? You're in the Spirit, you're reading the Word of God, you're meditating, you're doing that, and somebody comes, sneaks up behind you and says, Right. It's startling. And John hears the words, and then he turns to see who spoke of him. Now, let's talk about the words in just a moment. He said, write in a book everything you see and send it to the seven church. Write it in a book. Now, when we think of a book, we think of something like this. A book. That's not what it is. Although, that's the way we think. Do you ever wonder why books of the Bible are called books of the Bible when they're so short? Some of them are just one chapter long. Some of them are just four or five chapters. They're not very big. Some of them are 66 chapters. One is 66 chapters long. Isaiah. 66 chapters long. That's a long. I'm going to read that one Sunday morning. Go through it. I say, that'd be a long sermon. But the word biblion, Bible, has to do with a book. It's literally a translation of the book, but actually it was a scroll. In the book of, uh, in the translation of Luke chapter 4, verse 17, in the English Standard Version, it says this, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him talking about Jesus. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written. That's the word, the word scroll there is the word biblio. Now if you go to the New King James Version in chapter 4 verse 20 it says this, then he closed the book and gave it back to the attendant and sat down and the eyes of all who were in the synagogue were fixed on him. The word for book there is the same word as the word biblio. By the way, that illustrates how you can translate something correct and it be wrong. Because when you say book to us, we think of a book. We don't think of something like this. Scrolls. <laughs> this is in the uh, a picture from the Parliament in England. 
of all the old, old legal documents. And they were written on books. Biblical. No, they're written on scrolls. We call them scrolls. And so what he's telling them, I want you to write this in a book, but the book is going to look like a scroll. So I want you to record these things because you're going to witness beyond this island. You're going to tell others, you're going to continue your ministry, but it's going to be a ministry of writing, of writing these things down. Which reminds me of this truth. We have to witness to what we know. We have to witness to what we know. This book, the book of the Revelation, this scroll that John wrote, is going to be a benefit to everyone who reads, hears, but particularly to those who obey what is written herein. It was not merely for John's benefit, but is a benefit for all people. Look at chapter 2, verse, uh, just a second, I'll find it here in a second. Verse 7, 2, 7. This phrase is going to be repeated at each of the individual messages to the churches. It says this, anyone with ears to hear must listen to the Spirit and understand what he is saying to the churches. You're going to have to listen. Every church was going to have to listen to what God was saying to the other churches. Now listen, if you and I are going to stand against the world, if our testimony is to go forth, if we're going to tell people about Jesus Christ's death and resurrection and second coming, if we're going to encourage people to prepare for that, we've got to listen to what Jesus wants the church to be. We've got a tremendous opportunity in Bible such a church. One of these days we're going to get back in our building. But we, it's forced us to take a look at what do we ought to be? What should we be as a church? I would suggest that you ought to go to the head of the church and find that out. That's not the Pope in Rome. That's Jesus standing in the midst of the church. What Jesus says you and I ought to be what we ought to be together is what we ought to be together. We need to be listening to what he says to Ephesus and find out what they did that was good and what they needed to work on. Same thing when he goes to the other church. We need to be looking at what did Jesus commend them for doing. We ought to be doing that and we ought to be staying away from this other nonsense that had crept into these churches. We're going to need to see what God says to these churches. Now, why is that important? Well, a friend of mine, Dr. Darrell Bach, in a book he's published four or five years ago, said this. Now listen, this is very important. This ought to encourage you greatly. Our world is changing. So Pastor, I need that. What you, well, hang in there. I'm not there. I just got started. But in many ways, we as a church community are going back to the future. In other words, our world is becoming more like the world that the earliest church lived in. So the way the early church engaged culture can teach us much about negotiating our own future. You know what he's saying? He's got a doctorate degree. He's, he's a professor. So he writes it a little Let me tell you that this book is becoming more relevant to the way we live. Every day our culture is changing. We're getting, we're getting back to a non-Christian culture. People don't know the Bible. They don't believe the Bible, but they don't know what it says. They just don't believe it. And you and I have the opportunity to look at the Word of God, to read these chapters 2 and 3, and what will come later, but take the chapters 2 and 3, and say, this is how we ought to live in a world that's changing back to a non-Christian world. To a world that's ignorant of the Word of God. To a world that hates God and they don't even know who He is. They don't like Jesus except this phony image of Jesus they've built in their own minds. And you and I can use the Word of God and it's going to be more readily applicable to our situation than it was when I first heard the book of the Revelation talk about 30 years ago. John turns around. And it's interesting to me, as I've mentioned before, the first thing you notice are the seven gold lampstands. You got this dazzling person standing in the middle of it. The first thing he knows is his lampstands. Well, 
that's all right. Sometimes we look at things, but it's really important because he tells us in verse 20, or Jesus tells in verse 20, those lampstands stand for each of the seven churches. And Jesus is standing in the midst of those seven churches. Now, what in the world is all this about? What's a gold lamp saying? Well, they didn't have electricity. Some of you are old enough to remember kerosene lamps or coal oil lamps. Maybe during a hurricane, you had somebody pulled out an old lamp. You lit it, had oil in the base, and you lit it, it was bright. Well, it's, it's oil, but it's not like that. There's a picture I've got up here of, of an oil lamp. We're talking about something like this. You fill it at the top, you put a wick in it, and then you light that and you give us lamp. You're talking about something with whole, something like this, something about the size of my hand, about the width of my hand, a little small lamp, and you would have something that would hold that up high enough so it's giving light. Now, where did it come from, that idea come from? Well, in the book of Numbers, chapter 8, the Lord said to Moses, Give Aaron the following instruction. Now, listen. When you set up the seven lamps in the lampstand, does that sound familiar? When you set up the seven lamps in the lampstands, place them so their light shines forward in front of the lampstand. You know what he's talking about? He's talking about in the tabernacle, I want you to have light inside this thing that has no light. It's blocked off all the outside light. You're going to need light, and I'm providing with light. And so Aaron did that. He set the seven lamps so they reflected the light forward, just as the Lord had commanded Moses. You know what he's saying? Jesus is standing like a priest in the midst of these seven lampstands, and he's directing their light out to the world so the world can see. That's what a church is. God wants to direct our light out there into the world so they can see. We're the only light, listen to me, we're the only light there is in the world. The world is in darkness. They have no clue how God wants them to live, what is the best way to live, how to be holy, how to produce what God wants to produce, which is godly children. They haven't got a clue. They have no idea what's going on. And they're in total darkness, and along comes an oil lamp. Now, if you've ever been in a dark situation during a hurricane or during a power outage and it got dark at night, it's amazing how much one little flame will light up a room. You know, if you give it time, you can begin to see all around it. We went one time to Williamsburg, Virginia. We went to a, a nighttime concert at the governor's mansion. They didn't have electricity back then, then either. So all these musicians had these big candelabras on, the, on their instruments, on the piano and the harpsichords and all these things. And I mean, just, and they put out a lot of light. You can see all the way across the room because it was the only light there. If you've got one light, it stands out to you. You and I are the light of the world. That's what he said. And Jesus says, in the midst of you, I am standing here and I'm going to correct which direction you're facing so that you produce the maximum amount of light in the world. That's chapters 2 and 3. He is in the midst of us. Now, the next thing he says he notices is this person in the middle. Somebody like the Son of Man. That tells us that Jesus is a man. He has the appearance of a human being. He's not a spirit. He's not a ghost. He is a real person. Back in Matthew chapter 24, verse 30, he said, and then at last, Jesus talking, the sign that the Son of Man is coming will appear in the heavens, and there will be deep mourning among the peoples of the earth, and they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Church, that's your message to the world. You're going to see Christ coming in power and great glory. This Jesus who the world crucified, who suffered and died, is coming back again. We need to get ready. Jesus is coming. But first, 
He came as a man. Why? You know why? So he could die on our behalf. He is our Savior. He is also our priest. This is, I get this from the robe. The word for robe here is a foot robe. It means a robe that goes all the way down to his feet. It's a picture of a priestly robe. robe. Now, the, the gold sash is not like a Miss America sash. Jesus coming not just to think about world peace. He's coming to bring world peace. But his sash goes like this. It goes around his chest, and that's what ties the robe to him. It's the kind of thing a priest might wear. Long robe got this around him. When you go back in scriptures and you look up this idea of a robe, you go back to Genesis 49, at least chapter 49, and you'll find a description of from Judah that the, the, there will come one who will wear a long robe that's wine-colored robe. It's the color of blood. And we read some verses earlier about the end of Revelation about that. It's tying it together. He is a high priest doing what a high priest does. I'm in God's tabernacle and I'm directing the light. Third, he's eternal. I get that from where it says, and his head and his hair were white like wool, as white as snow. It's the color of age. Nowadays, of course, you can get it in a bottle. That's the way I do it. No. Uh, but I see, I see girls that obviously are young and they've got they dyed their hair gray. I'm thinking, just give it time. It'll make it, you know, you'll get that gray look. But that's what's pictured. Back in Daniel chapter 9, verse uh, Daniel 9 says this, And I watched as thrones were put in place, and the ancient one sat down to judge. His clothing was as white as snow, and his hair was purest wool. It's a picture of God, the oldest one in all the universe, because he's the one that created everything. Here is Jesus being pictured symbolically. By the way, all of this is, is symbolic representation of what he's seeing. He's seeing Jesus as the eternal one. He's got that hair as white as snow. It's white like wool. He is the one who predates the creation. He is the creator. He is the eternal one. He is presenting himself here as God, the creator, the ancient one. His eyes are flames of fire. Is that really, I shouldn't have to explain what that is. You're somebody with their eyes flame of fire, you know, one, somebody's in trouble. Kind of like you go home and your wife is upset. Her eyes are like flames of fire. You're so relieved when you find out it's one of the kids. Not you. <laughs> well, Jesus is coming to judge. He's got eyes like flames of fire. He's not coming back to save. He's coming back to rule. He's coming back to stop evil in the world and make things right from here on out. He is coming to judge, and that's the picture of the flame. The good news for us is the flames will not hurt us. Isaiah chapter 66, verse 15 says this, See, the Lord is coming with fire, and his swift chariots roar like a whirlwind. He will bring punishment with the fury of his anger and the flaming fire of his hot rebuke. Jesus is coming to judge. Our message is not only that Jesus Christ is coming, but he's coming back to judge. We'll see that image again when we get to the church of Thyatira. Number five, it says his feet are like polished, refined bronze. Now, the word translated bronze doesn't occur anywhere else in anywhere. We just can't find it anywhere else. It's a combination word, however, of words we know. One word is the word uh, for copper. That's part of the word. That's part of it. It's a compound word for copper. And the other word is used for frankincense. What in the world would copper and frankincense have together? Well, you put frankincense in a sensor and you make the sensor out of metal. So it's, a, it's, it's combining those things, like a copper sensor. Remember, we're in a priestly setting. We're in a tabernacle setting. We're in a worship setting. He said his feet are pure, like that copper refined bronze, that refined copper. It's made in, in pureness. And I think this speaks of Jesus' holiness. Remember the holy... 
Moses saw the Lord in the flaming fires of the burning bush. He said, take off your shoes because the place where you're standing is holy ground. I think this is a picture of Jesus' holiness. It's put together to tell us the one who is morally pure is coming back to judge. And you need to get ready. You need to get ready. You need to get ready. They tell all those people after you, you better be ready. Folks, Jesus is coming. And there's not going to be, well, I'm no worse than so-and-so. The measure is going to be the Holy One, Jesus Christ. Are you as good as Christ saved you to be? Are you what He created you to be? And if not, He's going to be judging you. The sixth thing that He mentions is His voice. It's like the thunder of ocean waves or raging floods. If you've ever been around, and I realize in Louisiana you don't get this, but if you've ever been around where there's a tremendous waterfall, you know the roaring sound. You go to Niagara, you go to Victoria Falls, or some of these big high things where the water's pouring. It's this tremendous roar. It's just an overwhelming sound. It tells me that he's the boss. Uh, Psalm 29.3 uses this term. It says, the voice of the Lord echoes above the sea. Well, that's loud. The glory of God, the God of glory thunders. The Lord thunders over the mighty sea. He will be heard. When Christ comes back to judge, he will be heard. And then he says, I looked in his right hand and he had seven stars in his right hand. Well, that's a big right hand. You've got seven stars in there. Seven stars are in his right hand. Well, what do the stars represent? Somebody look down verse 20. What do they represent? Angels. This is a pictorial representation of angels. There's seven stars. It's picturing the angels. And Jesus tells us these stars, these angels, represent the messengers to each of the churches. Just as an individual has a guardian angel, each church has an angel assigned to it. And they are the representative of Jesus Christ. He rules over the church. He is sending his message through his messengers. Now, I don't think he's talking about pastors there. Although that is one suggested possible uh, application of that, interpretation of that. I think he's really talking about an angel who guides in the hearts and minds and the, and the work of the church. He said, I want to send you a message. This is what I'm expecting of this. Now apparently it has special meaning to the church at Ephesus because he begins that description with that re reference. I'm the one who holds the stars in the right hand. But it applies to all of them as well. And then there's a strange, number eight is a strange image. As if all these others went on. Well, this one's strange. A sharp two-edged sword came out of his mouth. This is a symbol for the word of God going forth in judgment. It goes out as a sword that cuts both ways. Any way it goes, it's going to cut. It's going to divide. It's going to deal with people such as the people at Pergamum that were, were peddling false teaching. And the word of God is going to cut them down. People need to counter the false words that people are teaching. That's our responsibility as a church. Or else Christ is going to come and he's going to judge the church with that. We are charged with dealing with those who <laughs> teach falsely. We are charged with judging those who live in moral lives and teach others to live that kind of life as we saw in Jude. And then finally, Number nine, it says his face was hard to look at because it was like looking directly at the sun. You might have a shot at it today. Uh, it was a little cloudy when I came in, but I believe it's clear enough that when you go out, I want you to take a look and look up at the sun. You won't do it long because it hurts. You just can't look at the sun. You've got to have, even with the, got these sun filters, uh, there's coming a, a lunar eclipse or a, a solar eclipse next year. And I've been through one of those. We had to take film off of Polaroid, which is old school right there. It's coming back. You had to take film like that and look through that film because they don't look up at it naturally. You've got to look through something else to see this. It's painful to look at the sun. Jesus Christ is so bright because he is the light. He is the light. Jesus Christ is the one who will be the light in that eternal city. No longer will you need the sun to shine by day 
for the moon to give its light by night, for the Lord your God will be your everlasting light, and your God will be your glory. I want you to notice what John did. Verse 17. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as if I were dead. Why did he do that? Why did he fall at his feet as though he were dead? John is Jesus' best friend. This is the guy that walked with him. This is the guy that, you know, they reclined. And when they were reclining, Jesus was right here beside him. And he was able to just turn and whisper to Jesus and ask him a question. He's that close to Jesus. But when he sees Jesus in his glory, John falls terrified at his feet as though he were dead. He just collapses. This is Jesus' best friend. And Jesus has to reach out and say to him, be comforted. I think it's a picture for us that, like Jesus, we need reassurance. When you come to understand who Jesus is and to know that there is coming a day when you and I will stand before him in judgment individually. It's not anybody on earth that's ever lived or will live that will not stand before Jesus Christ in judgment. And his judgment will be perfect judgment. And he will be holy in his judgment. I don't want to give you a little fear, frankly. But he says, I don't want you to be afraid. Don't be afraid. Why? Because I'm the first and the last. Don't let anything or anybody take the place of Jesus in your life. He's the first and the last. Dedicate your life to Jesus Christ. <clears throat> Make every decision in your life. Everything you spend your time on, everything you decide I'm going to do, is this what Jesus wants me to do. He's first and last. He said, I am the first and the last. I began the world, and I'll bring it to its conclusion. I started time, I'm going to end time. While you're here, the most important thing is Jesus. And then he says, I'm the living one. I died, but look, I'm alive forever and ever. All of us are going to die if the Lord tarries long enough. But some of us, in the days in which we face, are going to die sooner than that. We're going to die for the testimony of Jesus Christ. We're living in a world that hates Christians. There are people in the United States of America. There are people in New Orleans, Louisiana, and the surrounding area that cannot stand Christians. They think you're the most hateful people on earth. They think you're people that are so... It would be a joy for them to get rid of you from the place of the earth. If you would shut up, that'd be fine but they want to eliminate you. And if they get in power, and when they get in power, when their attitude and their actions take over, as they do in certain areas, then you'll be eliminated. That's what John was writing to these folks about. Not all of these churches were under the threat of imminent death, but some of them were, and some of them would be. There are people all over the world today who are Christians, there are great people in, in Manipur, India, who are hiding in the jungle because there are people who want to kill them. There are people in Burma, not Burma, uh, Malaysia, uh, that want to kill Christians. And when they get the opportunity, they do it because they think they're doing a service to God. You need to understand, there are people like that in the world. That's, they're out there. Jesus says, I've been through it. It's no big deal. Because I died and I rose again. You realize the worst that anybody can do to you is put you to sleep for the night? That's what resurrection is. The worst they can do is put you to bed. You're getting up in the morning. Because Jesus died and rose again. 
Death is not something to fear. Don't worry about what they do. Don't worry about being put in prison. Don't worry about suffering. Don't even worry if they threaten to kill you. What can they do? They put you to bed. You're going to rise up because he says, I hold the keys of death and the grave. A lot of people can put you in the grave. Jesus is the only one that can bring you out. Amen. He said, I've got the power to do that. Don't be that. You need, I need, we need that reassurance. But we also need the perspective that he offers us in this book real quickly. Number one, we need to know that Jesus Christ is the one that can raise us from the dead. We keep our eyes focused on him. He is the one to whom we appeal. He is the one we follow because he is the leader. That's the vision of what is right now. You need to know that from here to the end of the world, Jesus rules. He's in charge. All authority has been given to him. You can follow him. But secondly, you need to understand what's happening right now. He said, write the things which are now happening. He's talking about chapters 2 and 3. During the church age, these are the things that we as a church are going to encounter. Maybe not all of them all the time, but some of the things that we're going to read about in chapters 2 and 3 are going to happen to Bible-centered church. And we need to understand his perspective on those things so we don't overreact or underreact. So that we don't give up our testimony, but we faithfully tell the truth about Jesus Christ. As we look at beginning next Sunday, we're going to start looking at the things he commands and the things he criticizes so we understand what we need to be as a church. But we also need the perspective on the future that we find in chapters 4 through 18. Things are bad now. They will get worse as time goes on. Beginning of chapter 4 through chapter 18, and actually into the beginning of chapter 19, you find about a seven-year period of time that's coming. Three and a half years are not going to be that bad. Some people are going to die, but you've got a pretty good chance of surviving it unless you're in the spot. It's kind of like a hurricane. If you're not where a hurricane's coming, it's, it could be okay. That first three and a half years, people say, well, you know, there are a lot of people dying. There's a lot of wars. There's famines. There's people dying, but not here. That's the first three and a half years. It's not likely you're going to survive the last three and a half. When we read about what's happening in that last three and a half years, it'll be lucky that anybody survives. In fact, if it had gone on four years, nobody, there would be nobody left alive on the earth. It's that bad what's coming during that time. You and I need perspective on that. The people who are going to live through that time will definitely need to understand and have the perspective that we leave them with in our writings, in our testimonies, just as John has done. Jesus has revealed himself so that you and I can be reassured that when hard times come, we can still see him. And as our Stanfield wrote in one of his hymns, he said this, his song, and then I hear him, hear him gently say to me, I left the throne of glory, but counted it but lost. My hands were nailed in anger upon a cruel cross. But now we'll make the journey with your hand safe in mine. So lift your cross and follow close to me. It's about to give him prayer. Lord, we can face anything with our hand in yours. If we believe that, Lord, we're not anxious to suffer. We're not anxious to be ridiculed. We're certainly not anxious to be killed. But Lord, if that is your plan for us, then Father, we know that your Son, Jesus Christ, has led the way. And Jesus, we know that you walk with us every step of the way. Lord, whatever is coming, you're with us. Lord, even if it means our death, we know, Lord, that we're in your hands even still. And that you have in that hand the key of death, the key that opens the door to resurrection. Father, help us to be faithful 
in our testimony to Jesus Christ. We ask this in his name and for your glory. Amen.